Hello, I'm Dr. Marianne Teitelbaum, and today we're going to talk about some groundbreaking research that's being done on the lung microbiome. Now, the word microbiome means the vast array of organisms that live in and on our bodies whose cells and genes carry out many functions necessary for life. We're all aware of the gut microbiome because much research has been done on it over the pe past few decades, and more and more research money <clears throat> is being given to deepen our understanding of this important factor in our health. In fact, many microbiome centers are opening up around the country to further examine its implications for our health. Now, recently advanced technology has enabled researchers to identify <clears throat> and study the inhabitants of the human respiratory system. They used to think that the lung was a sterile organ with hardly any bacteria in the lung in its normal state, and only when you have a disease state like pneumonia or cystic fibrosis would it become inhabited with bacteria. You would then use antibiotics to clear the infection out of the lungs. But now researchers have identified that the lung has its own microbiome, which even though it's much smaller than the gut microbiome, it nonetheless plays an important role in preventing diseases of the lungs. This makes sense because any part of our bodies which, are, which interact with the outside environment like the air, need a thriving, balanced microbiome consisting of friendly bacteria whose one of many roles is to prevent infection. Again, this makes sense because the environment outside of the body is teeming with infection, which means that every breath you take, there's infection in it. But our friendly bacteria are the first line of defense, and they prevent these invading pathogens from doing us any harm. So as a result, there's this thriving microbiome in the gut which is the largest microbiome in the body. But the skin also has friendly bacteria on it to prevent skin infections from taking hold. And the nasal passages have their own unique cultures of friendly bacteria designed to prevent infection from growing in there. In fact, the latest research shows that steroid nasal inhalers can kill this microbiome off, allowing infection to grow in the sinus passages. And these infections from the sinuses have been found to travel into the brain and are seen in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. We also now know that there's a microbiome in the mouth, preventing all types of gum and tooth infections. The interesting thing to note here is that the lung microbiome seems to mimic the mouth microbiome in that it has similar bacteria inhabiting it. That too makes sense because when we breathe in, the friendly bacteria in the mouth can travel into the lung and populate the microbiome there. Now, what happens if the lung microbiome gets disturbed? Well, infection, inflammation, and a disease state can quickly set up as the microbiome no longer functions in a way that promotes health. The next question is then, what would disrupt this normal, healthy, functioning ecosystem? The researchers have found that steroids, antibiotics, acid reflux medicines, Vaccines and birth control pills can wipe out the friendly bacteria in the lung microbiome. So can breathing in air pollution, ozone, diesel exhaust particles, they're all harmful to the lungs, along with the processed food diet, exposure to cigarette smoke, and poor quality air. Since we're bringing in hundreds of liters of air into our lungs every hour, it's important that the air we breathe be as fresh and clean as possible. Now, a recent asthma study showed that a bacteria called Pseudomonas, a dangerous pathogen, is more prevalent in people who have severe asthma, but it's hardly seen in the normal lung. Also, fungal organisms are found in those with asthma. Here's what happens. Once you deplete the friendly bacteria with a round of antibiotics, infection can immediately start growing. And when the body is fighting infection, inflammation results, which is what asthma is. It's chronic inflammation in the lungs due to the chronic infection, which is growing unabated in the lungs. Here's something even more interesting that the researchers have found. Some viruses can actually go inside the bacteria found in the lungs and hide out in there. When the person takes an antibiotic, the bacteria will die off, which causes the viruses to explode out into the lung, creating a huge viral burden in the lung. So apparently, antibiotics help initially but they can sometimes create bigger problems later on down the road. Another question we can ask is, what diseases of the lungs might be vulnerable if the lung microbiome becomes depleted? 
The answer is asthma, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, pneumonia, and other lung infections, since essentially the immune system of the lung, the microbiome, is depleted. Take asthma, for example. Doctors have always understood that chronic inflammation is what is causing the asthma, but no one really ever understood what was causing the chronic inflammation in the first place. They didn't understand why the inflammation wouldn't go away. Usually after a viral or a bacterial infection, the inflammation which results from the immune system attacking the pathogen eventually goes down after a short period of time. But with asthma and many other lung diseases, the inflammation never goes away. So they found out that bacteria, viruses, and fungi not only initiate the inflammation, but they can sustain it indefinitely when they're left unchecked to constantly multiply deep in the lung tissue, creating all kinds of infections, inflammation, and diseases. Now here's another problem researchers are encountering. The main treatment to treat asthma is to treat it with inhaled corticosteroids. But now they see that these are the very type of medicines that deplete the friendly bacteria in the lungs in the first place, allowing the chronic infections and inflammation to develop once the lung loses its immunity. So the very same thing that treats asthma can cause it. The same scenario of chronic infection causing inflammation is seen with COPD, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema. Researchers at the University of Chicago have been studying two religious groups in South Dakota and Indiana who live back to nature, where they're avoiding pharmaceutical use as much as they can, they're raising their children on healthy home-cooked food, and allowing them to play outside in the fresh air on their organic farms, come into, coming into contact with the earth and soil, which promotes a healthy gut and lung microbiome. These children are not developing allergies and asthma at the epidemic level seen in children who are exposed to the non-ending rounds of antibiotics and vaccines that most children receive nowadays. The researchers know this much so far. The disruption of the gut microbiome in a critical window in the development of the immune system in the early childhood years leads to long-term chronic problems. And there are many different diseases that are being linked to disturbance of this friendly bacteria during this critical stage of life. The original disruption from these medications occurs in the gut microbiome, but researchers have now shown that when you disrupt the microbiome in the gut, the largest microbiome, having the largest effect on our immune system, the ramifications are felt throughout the whole body. The gut microbiome isn't just affecting the gut, but can affect the immune response in the heart, the liver, the kidneys, and of course the lungs. And researchers have also demonstrated that the gut microbiome affects all the other microbiomes, such as in the lungs, due to the vast network of communication that occurs throughout all the microbiomes. Which means that if one microbiome gets disturbed, it can have far-reaching consequences on all the other microbiomes. And we're finding evidence now that fungi and bacteria can even attach to the smog and air pollution that we breathe in piggybacking their way into our lungs. Even in areas where there are hog farms, there are many particulates in the air that are being inhaled by the people in the areas around the farms. In fact, several years ago, I spoke to a pulmonologist from the Midwest who said that many people out there who live in these farming communities have some issues with their lungs due to the surrounding hog farms and the type of air pollution they create and the constant spraying of pesticides from airplanes onto the fields only makes matters worse. So the final question is, where do we go from here? How can we restore our lung and other microbiomes now that we have all taken some of these medications and we've breathed in air pollution and other toxic fumes? The research is still in its very early stages, but the first thing you can do is to replenish at least the gut microbiome after the use of these medications as quickly as you can using probiotics or homemade yogurt, buttermilk, lassi, or takra. Studies have shown that improving the gut microbiome will in turn help the lung microbiome as well. We're just beginning to discover the names of some of the friendly bacteria inhabiting the mouth and the lungs, and hopefully probiotics for these areas will be available for all of us to take because again, 
the microbiome in the mouth and the lung are similar. Fortunately, in Ayurveda, we already have many successful treatments for the lungs. We have numerous herbs and herb formulas to clean the lung tissue, to facilitate the repair of the individual lung cells, to stop the reactivity of the toxins that are being held in the lungs. We have potent bronchodilators, which don't make the heart beat fast, and anti-inflammatories, which work like steroids, but will not destroy the friendly bacteria in these delicate mucous membranes of the lung and gut. We have a special mouthwatch, which prevents gum infections, but keeps the microbiome in the mouth intact. The same is true for our nausea or our inhaled herbalized nasal oils, which keep the mucous membranes in the nasal passages well lubricated, which allows the friendly bacteria to grow. We also have breathing treatments using herbal steams inhaled into the lungs and sinuses to gently destroy the pathogens while keeping the good bacteria intact. And one of my personal favorite herbal treatments to be taken at the first sign of a cold or flu is a formula of herbs which can knock out both bacterial and viral upper and lower respiratory tract infections without destroying the gut or the lung microbiome. It's best to try these types of antiviral, antibacterial remedies first before using the potent antibiotics. Reserve antibiotic and steroid use for dire emergencies. And if you do have to use them, go to work immediately on restoring the friendly bacteria. I can't wait to see how we might treat diseases of the lungs differently in the future. Instead of using steroids and antibiotics, hopefully we can fix many of the chronic lung conditions by repopulating the friendly bacteria in the lung, allowing true healing to occur. It's been stated by Natasha Trenev, founder of the Natrin Probiotics Company, that, quote, antibiotics were to the 20th century what probiotics are to the 21st century, unquote. I think she might be right. And as doctors grapple with new and improved ways to treat these diseases, they will eventually wind up using approaches that Ayurvedic doctors have always used for centuries. Doctors who knew how to both prevent and treat disease while preventing dangerous side effects, which, if left unchecked, can themselves cause disease. I hope this information gives you hope for healing your, your acute and chronic upper and lower respiratory conditions using alternative remedies, which won't create a bigger disturbance further on down the road. Thank you.